This morning, we are going to ponder the meaning of hope. Last week, I asked my Bible study to finish this. I hope. Some gave a personal desire, such as, I hope I can see and touch my grandchildren soon. Or, I hope the weather gets warmer. Well, that already happened. (laughs) Others had a more encompassing answer, such as, I hope more people see this virus situation as a blessing in disguise. Or, I hope the government will take care of the food insufficiency. Most of the times we use the word hope, we are actually making a wish. We're asking for something we cannot control. Hope isn't, I hope the sports team start playing again soon, or I hope you have a good day. It's not a feeling or an emotion. Hope is the knowledge of facts. Hope is not, I hope so, but rather, I know so. Hope may give many many people something to look forward to, but for Christians, hope is essential in order to have joy. Not necessarily happiness, but rather true joy. For a Christian, hope is something ever so much better than wishing for something to happen. It is something that is definite because it's grounded in the word of God. In Hebrews 6, 18 and 19, it says, So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have a great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. The number of times the word hope is used in the Bible depends on which translation you are using. In the one we've been using, the New Living Translation, the word hope is used 159 times. Let me share a few of those verses. Psalm 42, 5. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Psalm 119, 74. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Romans 15:13 I pray that God the source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the holy spirit The author of 1 Peter is writing to a people who are facing or who soon will be facing persecution everyone will suffer at some time, perhaps many times in their life. Some will be overcome by it. Others will be able to face it because they know they are not alone and their hope is in Christ. Listen again to what we heard in First Peter chapter 3. Now who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right... God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship the Lord your God, the Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Are you able to explain your hope to others? Our hope comes from Jesus Christ. Some Christians believe their faith is a personal matter that should be kept to oneself. It's not helpful if we keep pressuring people and are obnoxious in sharing our faith, but we should always be ready to give an answer, gently and respectfully, when asked about our faith, our lifestyle, or our Christian perspective. Others should be able to see our hope in Christ. Are you prepared to tell them what Christ has done or is doing 
in your life? When Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives, each crisis becomes an opportunity for witness. Every Christian should be able to defend their hope in Christ, especially in hopeless situations. A crisis creates the opportunity for witness when a believer behaves with faith and hope because the unbelievers will notice. People will notice how you handle your suffering. 1 Peter 3.15 reminds us that the hope that is within us as we worship Christ is the Lord of our lives. Peter urges us to share in a gentle and respectful way. You know what? Arguments do not convince people to love God. The gospel will be heard far better when Christians speak gently and respectfully. Peter is not suggesting that Christians argue with lost people, but rather that we present to the unsaved an account of what we believe and why we believe it in a loving manner. The purpose is not to win the argument, but to win lost souls to Christ. In order to be a good witness to our faith to others, we must live in a way that is pleasing to God. When we do that, we have peace in our hearts. And when we have peace within, we can face the battles without. We cannot boldly witness to others if we are not setting a good example. Some of you may remember that several years ago, the southern half of Yellowstone National Park was consumed by a forest fire. Thousands of acres of virgin forest burned to the ground. The resulting devastation looked like a moonscape with nothing having a possibility of living. But some feared the disaster would have irreversible ecological impact. However, the first shoots of green started with the very first rain, just days after the fire. And as the years have passed, there have been an incredible rebirth from the ashes and devastation. New life in dead places. Isn't that what God is doing in us, to us, and for us? If God can bring new life out of the destruction of nature, surely He cares for us even more. God will also bring beauty from your ashes. As someone wrote, there are no roses without thorns and no victories without battles. Whatever battle you are facing today, you are not facing it alone. When you suffer for doing what is wrong, such as, well, driving well above the speed limit, it's it's relatively easy to bear. You simply get what was coming to you for disregarding the law. However, when you suffer for doing what is right, such as telling the truth and being fired because of it, you can respond by getting even, by getting angry with God or giving up on your faith. Or you can respond like Jesus Christ who returned love for hatred. You've heard it said before. Trials can make you bitter or better. Ron Archer, a pastor and inspirational speaker, said, We have the power to choose to be people of faith or people of fear. And even fear can have its place. It can bring people to their knees to pray, to repent. Archer referred to the story of David who ran toward Goliath even when others, including King Saul, were afraid. Archer recalled an experience that taught him more about the lessons of David's story. During a trip to Israel, he once met some shepherds who carried staffs that were covered in in very interesting markings and dates. When he commented the staffs were beautiful, the shepherds quickly corrected him. They said, no, what this is, is every time we faced a crisis, dealing with a mountain lion or some sort of adversity, and God brought us through it, we would mark it on our staff, he said. We remember this day and carve it into our shepherd's staff and remember that the same God who rescued us from the hand of the bear or the hand of the lion is the same God who will take us through this virus 
or take us through this adversity. David said, your staff and your rod, they comfort me. And I never understood that until I met those shepherds in Israel. Wouldn't it be a great idea for us as well to mark in some way every time that God has brought us through some difficulty or painful experience? I encourage you to do that. When we get overwhelmed, exhausted, depressed, or suffer in any way, we can hold on to the hope that is ours through Christ. During the most difficult times in my life, the verse that sustained me most of all is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you hope and a future. Those words have helped me to endure a lot, and they continue to give me comfort and strength, hope, and a future. Right now, in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, people need a word of hope. The word of God can give us that hope in a way that nothing else can. Having Christ as their Savior means that the hopeless have hope, and our hope is the anchor for our soul. God never promised that things would be easy, but he spent he sent the Holy Spirit to comfort and guide us through every life circumstance. Jesus said, "Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. My peace I give you." Because we have that assurance, we can maintain our hope and then our belief and behavior will be a witness to others. Hope for a Christian is not the same as unfounded optimism. It is the confident expectation and blessed assurance of our future destiny, and it's based on God's love, which is revealed to us through the Holy Spirit and demonstrated in the death of Christ. Knowing that we have that hope, we can persevere through even the most difficult trials and endure under persecution, suffering, because suffering here and now is temporary. And we must remember that. Blessing is eternal, and so are our lives in Christ. So even in the midst of suffering, we can function with joy because our hope is in Christ. That assurance is too good to keep to ourselves. We need to share with others the hope we have in Christ and the promise of all of eternity with God. If I were to get the coronavirus or some other serious illness right now and become very sick, I would want to get better. I'd like to have more time with my loved loved ones and, and have more time to spend in ministry. But if I were to die, I know that would be even better. Whether I live or die, I can be at peace because I know who holds my future. What greater hope is there than the hope of becoming more Christ-like and the hope of eternal life? When Christ is the center of our being, we are a people of hope. Romans 12:12. 12, 12, Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. I would like to leave you with these words to carry with you, especially when you are enduring suffering. Hope. H-O-P-E. Hold on. Pray expectantly. Hold on. Pray expectantly. Write those words down and keep them close to you. Keep holding on, clinging to the hope that is yours in Christ Jesus, and pray expectantly, knowing that the Lord is watching over you and working all things out for your good. He is your shepherd. You have everything you need. You do not need to fear evil. His rod and staff will comfort you. The Lord will restore your soul And when your earthly life is over, you will live with him for all of eternity.
that is your hope and my prayer for you. Because that is your hope as a believer, you will be able to explain, defend, and share your faith in God with others. Invite them to hold on and pray expectantly. You will be giving them a gift that lasts a lifetime. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living because he lives.